Oh, it's tomorrow. Tomorrow. You discover your belt. Alright, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Put it back. I'm pretty sure it's only 90 percent. Okay. Are we ready to go? Cool. So, my name's Kyle. Obviously, I think you all know that. Um, can I sit on this side? Yes. Oh, you're not in the shot. Oh, exactly. Okay. Okay. So, throughout my Fulbright stay, I um. I was studying Kogolith Force and how CO2 might um, kind of affect future Kogolith populations. So first of all, what are Kogolith Force? And this is kind of a review, like most of you, I think all of you are going to do, on our first presentations. So Kogolith Force are these microbial little microbes that live in the sea, and they grow all over the sea. They grow all over the ocean. Um, they form. They first evolved 220 million years ago. Uh, they, they only represent 5% of global primary production, but their important ecological function is that they form uh, calcium carbonate shells, which are then they, which is important because it regulates the calcium carbonate or the carbonate chemistry of the ocean, and because it's uh, a, a key factor in in sort of. Uh, sequestering carbon from the atmosphere. So they take dissolved carbon in the ocean and they uh, use it to make their shells which then turn into chalk and uh, like the white cliffs of Dover, that type of stuff. So um, an example of the blooms is this one off the coast of Alaska and you can see in relation to Alaska it's huge and um, the reason that it has that really pretty color and then we see these all over the world is because of the calcium carbonate which changes the way light reflects off of the ocean. So it's kind of one of those cool things where if you see super turquoise water, uh, it probably has something to do with calcium carbonate. So climate change, uh, as we've all seen, the earth is warming up. And so I kind of was thinking about a good way of conceptualizing how much 0.85 degrees Celsius, so it doesn't seem like very much, but there are 326 billion trillion liters of water in the ocean, approximately, because kind of their best estimate. And uh, <laughs> if one calorie, we all know what calories are, right? We eat calories. If one calorie is equal to one degree Celsius uh, for a liter, then there, and there are 500 calories in a completo, <laughs> yeah. it would take 6,520 6, trillion completos to change it one degree Celsius. So the Earth has almost eaten 6,520,000 6, trillion completos since 1880, uh, which is a pretty big number. So if we want to stop the Earth from eating as many completos. Um, so we gotta, we got to limit the amount of carbon that's uh, sort of being produced by humans right now. And one of the key things about the carbon production is that uh, it changes the carb carbonate chemistry of the ocean. And as we see from the data, the pH is dropping. And remember that pH is a logarithmic scale, so 0 0.1 degree, uh, 0 0.1 pH decrease is a lot bigger than it sounds, um, and it's expected to change up to 0.2 more over the coming uh, decades. And this is a graphic that I made of all the completos. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the first thing that I want to kind of talk about is coastal upwelling, which is a key thing off the coast of Chile, because we have huge wind currents that blow for long periods of time. When when wind currents blow for a long period of time, we have two different sort of uh, things that happen. We have Ekman transport and Coriolis effect, which I'm not going to go into. They get really mathematical really quickly, and I'm sure Mara would enjoy it, but I am not that mathematical of a thinker, and so I'm not going to get into it. Um, the, basic, the basic concept is the wind blows over the, f uh, over the water, and um, it causes water from very deep in the ocean to come up along the coast. And this deep cold water is very nutrient rich because a lot of nutrients sink down to the bottom of the ocean and it doesn't get perturbed that often. And so when it does, it rises up to the surface and it causes these huge nutrient rich sort of zones to form. And one thing that a lot of people don't know about, about coastal upwelling is that it's also very high in CO2. 
And so they actually, I was talking to a professor earlier this, while I was in Chile, and he was saying that they get up to 1,200 parts per million, which is four times what we're at right now in our average ocean water. So, or three times what we're at in our average ocean water. So it's a, it's a significant increase in CO2, in dissolved CO2. And what this leads to are these very adaptive coastal populations that, um, that sort of have to deal with this change every time it happens. So my hypothesis was based on that idea that uh, the very adaptive coastal populations might arise from these upwelling zones was that coastal populations, uh, since they are commonly exposed to variable CO2 conditions, um, will th uh, the coastal populations and coastal coccolithic forests specifically will thrive in higher CO2 experimental conditions as compared to uh, coccolithic forests in, in more oceanic environments. So what do we do? So first of all, I very simplified it. I mean, I, this is like the most simple I could get. Uh, the first thing we did, I did was culture a variety of different coccolithophores. I cultured, I think, six different strains, of, or six different species of coccolithophores and like 12 different strains. Uh, and we grew them in these little vials. And as you can see, they stack on top of each other and then we put a light on top of them and they just kind of go, go at it. So, um, uh, we then, after that, we transported them to a new location where, or I transported them to a new location where, um, we grew them in four liter bottles with growth media, media, and uh, we then created uh, experimental conditions with half CO2 and half uh, just normal atmospheric air. And uh, then we kind of measured the growth rate and determined what conditions were causing higher growth or lower growth. And so first of all, I want to talk about the site. Um, Di Chato was where we, we ended up uh, doing the experiment, and it's just north. If you if you see right here, I thought this was kind of funny. Uh, this was July of this year, and one of the only kind of cool zones was right here, where we are in Chile. And so, uh, I, it was very cold there. It was like, it was <laughs> frost on the ground, cold. But I, I can't complain too much because you two have had much worse, I'm sure. But you know, stuff, food food bur or, um, wood burning stoves were were they were a tough thing. So. Anyway, so this is the site. Um, a lot of it was what Dichato was wiped out a lot. A lot of Dichato was wiped out in the 2010 tsunami, after the earthquake, and so they had to rebuild. And as you can see, this was the old center. I don't know how well you can see, but it's the old center. It's totally gutted. The wave washed over and just ripped it out. And so this is the new center. Um, that was the one where I was working in. But even so, our our lab didn't have windows, so we didn't get any of this nice sun. So we had to go outside to see it. Um, which was, I don't know whether that was a good or a bad thing in the end, because it was hard enough to control in experimental conditions, but anyway. Um, so this is an example of, our, of my experiment. We have four liter bottles sitting in a, in a water bath that's used to control the temperature of the, of, the, of the environment. And we have the tube system, which caused me a lot of grief. It was, I think, a two month wait in the end of of trying to get this system to work and then telling me it was going to work and then it ending up not working. So uh, that, was a, that was a struggle, but we got through it. And, um, and yeah, and so in the end, it all worked out. And so the next, the next thing that I did was, well, well, I was doing analysis this entire time because uh, I used this thing called a uh, counting chamber or a hematocytometer. And this you use by putting a small aliquot of a sample in the little chamber and then you stick it under a microscope and you just count cells. So you sit under a microscope and you strain your eyes and you count cells. And it was just like hours of counting cells, which, you know, was, was fun. Um, but this is, what, what, this is what they look like. This is actually the best photograph, one of the better photographs I've ever seen under a, a normal light mic microscope. Uh, you can actually see, if you look closely, that there are, you can see the coccoliths. Uh, in in the photo, which is kind of cool, they're little round things that, that kind of get shedded as the as the, as the uh, cocoa the forest grow. So other other ways that we analyzed was we used scanning electron microscopy. Uh, so as you can see, these are two different types uh, of of cocoa the forest. Um, the one that you always see in photos, which is really pretty, is Emiliano Huxleyi, but 
these two are kind of different species, and you can see they have little bridges, which is also kind of a cool feature, but um, not probably not quite as pretty as a milioni. Um, and the, so we use this to evaluate the calcification of the strains, and we also use it to evaluate to make sure that the strains were uh, sort of uni unicellular. So here's an example. As you can see, these look very similar in terms of their shape and their form of their coccoliths, but these are much bigger because the scale is exactly the same, but the Ericksoni are, are very, very small. And so you can imagine counting these is much easier than counting those. So it was, uh, it was fun. It was a good time. Uh, so other ways that we used to analyze my samples were uh, we used flow cytometry, which is uh, advanced flow cytometry was uh, sort of, it's where you pass a stream of water containing your sample through a laser, and then you have a sensor on the other side that picks up whenever anything passes through that stream. And uh, one cool thing about this was that you can use dyes to excite certain wavelengths, which then you can detect and decide which wavelengths you can detect. It's really complicated really quickly, so I'm not going to get into too much detail. But this is an example of kind of what you get. This is a really uh, bacteria-dense, this was stained with them, cyber green, and it's a very bacterial-dense kind of uh, sample. And so this is the sort of data that I was looking at for the last weekend, which is why I had to get my presentation in a little bit later, because we just finished up this analysis last week. So, um, And then while I was at the site, I did even more analysis. We had so many different tests, I don't even want to get into some of them, because I didn't actually have to do them, because I had great lab mates. But um, these are um, fluorometers, which measure the fluorescence of a solution, which basically allows you to see how much living matter or living, ce or living cells that have, um, or photosynthetic cells there are in a, in a solution. So we have a handheld one and a much more powerful uh, fire system. And this was an interesting thing because uh, it's hard to get to know all these new systems. And I didn't, I didn't have, I didn't come in with any experience in any of this stuff. So trying to figure it out has been uh, a journey, part of the journey, I would say. So here are my results. As you can see, they were very inconclusive. Um, they. <laughs> The, the results were all over the place, and it was really, really frustrating because we spent so much time and money on this. But, you know, that's how science goes. And sometimes you got to look at the bright side, which, you know, if you look hard enough, you can always find that little pearl in the, in the, in the rough, you know. I don't know if that's the right expression, but anyway. Um, so, as you can see, these, these cell levels are going up and down a lot, which isn't really what you want to see. What you want to see is exp exponential growth. And I don't even think you could fit a trend line to most of these exponentially, in terms of exponential growth, just because they're so variable that the, the, it would just be a catastrophe trying to do it. So um, also, random cultures grew really well and others didn't, and we didn't really know what was going on, and we still haven't really figured it out. Uh, one of the hypotheses is that because we were doing it during the winter, it was harder for the cells to grow because it got cold. Um, Another hypothesis, hypothesis is that they're, they're, they're fixing a refrigerator in the, in the lab when we were there, so they were working the entire time and spraying chemicals all over the place. So that could have also impeded the growth of my um, cultures. Uh, another hypothesis is that, you know, uh, I, I was really frustrated, but um, we didn't use filters because I, they didn't think they had them, but it ended up they did. But we didn't use filters on any of the cultures, so we thought the bacterial growth might have ended up impeding some of the uh, actual coccolithophore growth. So, as you can see, the fire results were also really weird. Um, what, what you have here is quantum yield, and quantum yield is always supposed to be positive, but somehow we got negative values, which was pretty confusing. Um, so again, things didn't work out that well in terms of coccolithophore growth and in terms of things that we wanted to look at for this experiment. But on the bright side, after analyzing some of the data, um, you can see that I, I only did, I, this is like bared down, there was a lot of information to compress, but I didn't have that much time to do it. But um, as you can see from this, there's a basic trend that uh, the high CO2 treatment has a, a smaller amount of bacterial growth, which is something that you might want to consider more for the future because as CO2 levels rise in the ocean, 
we might have less bacterial growth, which could be a bad thing, could be a good thing, depending on you know what sort of uh, ecosystem you're in. But you know, again, finding the pearl in the rough or whatever that expression is. That's the diamond. 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 There we go. That's the one. The oyster. The oyster. Um, so, conclusion: the results were inconclusive. This experiment would have to be replicated under stricter conditions. I really think that if we controlled temperature and uh, probably uh, controlled better the air that was going into our media, it probably would have worked out better. But that's the way things go. Um, and, you know, we still got a ton of data from this, and it's a great example for the next time they want to run this experiment. Uh, for possible future work, we could do microbial CO2 experiments versus uh, coccolithophore CO2 experiments. Uh, this could be especially helpful in terms of community structure and in terms of figuring out uh, how microbial communities in the future are going to respond to higher CO2 levels, um, uh, which is going to be incredibly important. So, um, especially as we learn more about how microbes are ruling or governing our everyday life. Uh, again, and another thing we could do with this experiment is analysis of genetic material. We could determine uh, what sorts of bacteria are preferring CO2 versus non-CO2. We could determine um, what bacteria might be impeding coccolithophore growth. We could determine the viruses that might be there that might be infecting different populations of cells. And uh, finally, repetition with more strains. I only did four strains because I ran out of time because the system took so long to get set up. But uh, maybe in the future they can run it with more strains and, and really determine whether there's any sort of uh, relationship between coastal coccolithophore populations and oceanic coccolithophore populations and really determine if uh, coastal populations will recover more quickly than oceanic populations. Uh, another, another project I worked on, I, I really had two sort of uh, smaller projects that I also worked on, which was the sea markers. And because I learned how to use the flow cytometer, they needed uh, a basically a technician to, to, to uh, run a lot of their samples. And so I ended up helping them out with some of their um, sample analysis and making a small model. But um, the CMAR 21 cruise was a scientific expedition to, de to determine microbial diversity off the coast of Chile. And so what they did was they took uh, uh, samples from various depths and uh, longitudes at, along the coast of Chile, from, from the coast of Chile to uh, Easter Island. And then the samples were fixed and brought back to, to, to uh, La Catolica. And we're still working on this. Actually, I have a ton of samples that I can go analyze. I could probably do them another month here and just finish this up. But here's some of the data that you get. And these are kind of the cool kind of things that you can see, which is where kind of where, uh, for example, uh, Prochlorococcus might like to live, or where bacterial plankton like, might like to live. And then later we can go back and analyze what's going on in those zones that might give them a, an advantage in their growth cycles. Um, this, could, this is really interesting information, and they're doing a lot of this uh, work, but it's really expensive as well. So, acknowledgments. I have a ton of people I'd like to acknowledge, especially Dr. Von Nasso, because he was a huge support to me, and it was nice having being able to speak English in my uh, and then all these other people who helped me out um, in terms of doing the project and also with the analysis. It was a team effort. It was good. Anyway, thank you very much for listening to my presentation. I think we have time for one or two questions. Okay, any questions? So what I've seen is that bacterial, so what we're, what we're running in the lab were unicellular cultures which aren't exanic, which means that they have bacteria in them. Yeah. And what you typically see is a huge growth of bacteria when you first put the cells in, and then, or when you first put the coccolithophores in, and then once the coccolithophores start taking off and really start growing, the bacterial growth kind of settles, settles down and it doesn't, it doesn't like go, it doesn't keep ex exponentially growing. It doesn't outcompete coccolithophores, just probably because they're bigger and they've probably adapted some mechanisms to deal with bacterial growth. So I really, I don't know what role bacteria has 
because some of my some of my samples grew great with tons of bacteria in, this, in the cultures. And other ones were growing great without any bacteria. So I don't know whether you know. I'm sure there's some relation there, relationship there, but I just don't. I don't have enough data to really say. So I don't know if. Yeah. But the CO2 might be affecting it. It could be. It could be. The problem was is I didn't have I didn't have good growth in either of my Yeah, so I didn't I didn't couldn't establish any sort of relationship between any you know, CO two and non CO two kind of conditions.